This is the second part of a two-part series on the state of the ZK ecosystem. Um, and we're speaking with Anna Rose, um, the founder of ZK Podcast, ZK, ZK Summit, ZK Validator, ZK Hack, and probably um, a bunch of other ZKs, as well as Kobe, um, Kobe Gerken, who is the head of research at Geometry and works with Anna at ZK Validator and ZK Hack, and is also a cryptography advisor at C-Lab. If you've missed the first part of this double episode, go back to last week's and maybe start with that one because it's, it, it'll segue um, quite nicely from there. Without much further ado, let me tell you about our sponsors this week. Our sponsor this week is TellyHo. TellyHo is an open source wallet redefining the wallet as a public good. With TellyHo, you can safely connect to DeFi and Web3 plus a lot more. You can view your NFTs in the wallet across Ethereum, Polygon, Optimism, and Arbitrum. They have ledger support. You can swap between assets and view all of your account balances across um, in their portfolio tab. Currently, they're running a layer two adventure that rewards users for exploring the Arbitrum ecosystem with TellyO. You can get a space dog NFT and be entered into a giveaway for another NFT. Head over to telly.cash and check it out. And with that, let's head over to the second part of the interview with Kobe and Anna. So I think it might be a perfect time to start talking applications because I think that was where you wanted you wanted to sort of here are some of these like novel, cool ideas, right? Absolutely. That's <laughs> what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. So yeah, we we did before this interview, we compiled a bit of a list. And a lot of these are coming, by the way, from these interviews that we've done recently and like trying to pull together like what, you know, what Dan, for example, this interview we did with Dan Bonet, it was episode 256, like four weeks ago. Um, it's a wrong we, number. Yeah. It's a, it's a good number. Uh, but yeah, it's a wrong it was... Um, <laughs> we in that he went through a bunch of examples so we can definitely share those i also know in the interview i did with matt green i learned about some new ideas and generally i mean look if you look at what zero x park releases in their videos yeah. when they do showcases that's like an amazing space to find out about like new ideas and not the truth is not all of them are feasible at this moment, I think, but still like set the goal, like put the, you know, flag in the sand in the future and then let's build those tools so we can actually make these things possible. Yeah. I'm curious if you've been keeping up to date on this. Kobe, have you been paying attention to like Constitution DAO 2? Just a bit. So okay. I like, so. Uh, I, I like the concept of, um, of this anonymous multi-sigs so that's kind of the what the nucleo team is doing so um they're they're using uh privacy technology to like one of the things that they're doing is to hide who exactly participated in the multi-sig but in constitution DAO, they're using it to um hide the hide total the amount. amount that you would bid yeah exactly they're using yeah. this to hide the amount that you would bid because we all know what happened with the first constitution DAO where just because the amount was public, it was just outbid. Um, so yeah, I think they're using this in a, in a very cool way to, to, how, to hide this. But uh, yeah, that's the extent that I know it. <laughs> so yeah, this was the private DAOs. Um, one of the reasons for this was like, and this is what we talked about in that episode with Dan was, you know, yeah, when you're doing betting, when you're actually in an auction and you can see what other people have as their max, then it's pretty easy to win the auction. And I think that's kind of what happened. So yeah, this was a cool, so this is a really cool use case for this. Um, we do have Penumbra, which is like a privacy preserving deck. So that's like, and there's been a lot, like Manta also had proposed something like this. There's a lot of different like ways to think about what in a deck should be private and what can be private and what maybe can't be private. Um, and so those that's just been an interesting conversation space and like development space to, to define that. And I think Penumbra's solution is really cool. Uh, and just in terms of status though, like, you know, they are still test nets and like there's a lot to build before you can actually use these things. And um, maybe we can mention like some cool experiments that we've seen from Xerox Spark, right? So I think one, one thing that was really cool was this Hey Anon uh, experiment. So uh, may, maybe you've seen that on Twitter, but they, they've been taking these groups that maybe uh, have some relation 
uh, amongst the people. So, for example, all the people that participated in the DAO and got hacked, you know, so and now all of these people can uh, send a message as a participant or as a member in that group without revealing who, who you are. So the, this is something that they've published, which is, uh, which is really nice. Like you can, you can do that. Um, some other cool thing that I think technically it's very advanced. Uh, that's called ethdos. Actually, I don't remember what the, oh, okay. It's degree of separation. That's the, the acronym. So it allows you to prove, um, Oh yeah. Who you know and yeah. like who that person knows and so on. So how far in terms of the chain of people are you from Vitalik? That was the demo that they, they, they did. So uh, it uses actually like recursive proofs and extremely complex machinery inside Snarks to make that happen. Uh, just to prove this degree of separation. So that's something unique. Um, and another cool experiment that uh, that they did was Cabal, which allowed you to create these um, Discord channels or Telegram channels that have um, uh, pseudonyms um, that are derived from again a group of people that you know uh, in um, beforehand, but when they join the channel, then nobody knows who they were from that group. So those are some cool experiments that we've seen. Um, and I think uh, we could also mention some of Dan's experiments, right? Yeah, so Dan told us about this project where they, they're trying to almost do like image provenance even after it's been cropped or changed. So trying to prove that like, I, and I think the example or the use case here is like newspapers that will crop an image, but you want to know that it actually is from an original physical like, or a digital file or digital image. And so there's a ZKP to like prove that it's actually from that original one. And I know on our show, we talked about maybe even extending this to music or to film and like being able to prove like if you edit film that it's connected to an earlier version of that video footage, which is pretty exciting. This is, this is like one of these non-blockchain cool. ones. There is another non-blockchain <laughs> one to mention. This is mentioned on the episode I did with Matt Green, where apparently, and I don't know any real details on this, but apparently Google is looking to use ZKPs to like comply with GDPR rules, but still use private data. So it's almost like to go around <laughs> some of the privacy rules, like using it to like, oh, we can make it private with ZKPs, but like actually doing things that normally they wouldn't, they shouldn't be doing. Um or I, I don't know. I actually don't know enough about this to cast that much shade, <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah, I do. I want to mention also like a project that is live, which uses it and that's Sismo. So we actually had them present at ZK Hack and actually create these attestation badges. It's pretty cool. Like it's, it, yeah, I don't know, Kobe, do you want to, you want to go through how it works? I can help. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, actually, like it's interesting because um, when, when they started out, like I was talking to the Sismo founders and like, actually, I, I think this is when, when I was looking into StarkNet. So I was doing a project based on blind signatures that allow you to, um, get an attestation from like some issuer, but after you get this attestation, the issuer cannot track you anymore because you blind it in the process. So it was, um, it was a construction that I learned from Privacy Pass, which is a project from Cloudflare from a few years ago. Um, but I think nobody um, really deployed it in this context. So that, that was fun. And the Sismo people also created something of that sort when they started out. And that's what allowed them to create these badges, which are privacy preserving. So you have some issuers that maybe you trust or put some trust in, but nobody can track you, not even them after you do that. But they have since developed much more and they're using uh, ZK and membership proofs, like the ones that others like Zcash and the Projects from Lithium Foundation are using. And basically everyone that 
does privacy preserving transfers. And they're now doing other kinds of attestations um, that have even less trust in them, but still preserve these unlinkability properties. They seem to emerge, like people kind of treat them like POAPs, but they have a much <laughs> more interesting, uh, yeah, like something private and detached underneath, which is cool. Yeah, no, Susmo is one of the projects we've been meaning to have on for a while. So, nice. uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, other like so there's some there's some projects that have been around for a while like Semaphore or CLR Fund. Yeah. CLR Fund's like allowing you to do Gitcoin um, type donations, but privately, as far as I remember. Um, yeah, and then I'm trying to think like the, there's two areas. Like, well, actually, before I do that, Kobe, is there any other use cases that come to mind? I think we've covered our list. So yeah, I think I think like um, maybe there's. Worth to mention that there is a big group in the Ethereum Foundation that's called like PSE, like Privacy Scanning Explorations. They're doing a lot of projects that push the boundaries in ZK. So Semaphore was in there, which allows for anonymous messaging or signaling more correctly. Um, Sailor Fund is based on Macy, which is kind of a project that doesn't fit in the box exactly of privacy or scalability because it uses snarks to prevent collusion between people. Mm. And so it creates a more secure environment for voting. So that's that's really compelling. And but there's there's a bunch of other projects that are being worked there. So for example, there is a ZK Opro which combines private transactions with an optimistic roll-up kind of construction. And generally, um, they're doing like cool things. Um, but uh, Anna, what was the question? No, I think <laughs> it was, is there mentioned? any other use cases? I think what you're saying is like, if you want to find the good use cases, head to those places. <laughs> I, I actually, think like, yeah, I think uh, keep, keep watch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, as you're saying this, I was just thinking about like, so if, like any project that does ZK, like any network, they're going to have like a ZK education arm and they're going to want, you know, like they're creating a lot of content and ideas for their network. But there are like these three groups. And I think we count ZK Hack in that. It's like ZK Hack, Xerox Park, and P and uh, PSE. Because like in that case, well, I guess PSE is still very in Ethereum. And actually Xerox Park's very in Ethereum. But like generally there's a little bit more of a, like a neutrality for where and how you could deploy these things. So they're just like ideas and libraries, like things you can probably re recreate in other places. And so, yeah, it's definitely like my source for, for use cases. So there are two big, there are two big topics we haven't covered and that's ZK bridges and ZK ML, which is like the new, very exciting yeah. field <laughs> people are jumping into. Yeah. So maybe we can Audit. talk. <clears throat> Audits is also something that uh, I really want to talk about for a bit. Cool. But ZK Bridges sounds good. So uh, there's, there's uh, the succinct bridge. It also came out of Xerox Park. Um, in a way, it's a little bit, um, it's a piece of infrastructure that um, most people didn't really expect, right? Yeah. Uh, can you talk about how it works? Uh, yeah, uh, happy to. So usually when you want to get a bridge, like if you want the Holy Grail in some sense, or at least something very, very good, you want something which is a light client bridge so that you can verify the light client protocol of another chain inside your chain. And that allows you to get really high guarantees because you don't trust, let's say, like a multi-sig bridge of a small committee of signers or in an optimistic bridge, which is like very secure, but there is this synchrony assumption or at least- And it's also uh, game theoretically yeah. secure and not like exactly. mathematically secure, right? Yeah, and like there is like network dependency on, on like latency and stuff of that sort. So yeah, exactly. It's like different kind of security properties 
But the light climb bridge allows you to overcome a lot of these difficulties, especially in chains that have a deterministic finality where you can be certain that after a few blocks, things will not change. Um, which is true, for example, for Ethereum 2.0, but not true for Ethereum 1. So, And ZK bridges make it possible for chains that have, let's say, incompatible light clients um, communicate with each other. So when you want to verify the Ethereum 2.0 consensus, then you have to verify a lot of BLS signatures. And you have to do it on a very specific elliptic curve. And that, that's pretty hard. And it's pretty compute intensive in the context of a blockchain. So with the ZK bridge, you just run that, in, that whole protocol inside the SNARK. And then you just verify the proof, which is like, like we mentioned before, a lot of L1s already support primitives for proof verification. So you can do that, but you cannot do the light client directly. So ZK bridges give you that. So for example, so, if so you, it's, oh, a, yeah. it's, it's yeah. just a way of kind of getting the state of the, of the other chain, uh, yeah. trustlessly onto the chain that you're coming from, right? Yeah, exactly. So you now that you know you can verify the light client, you now know what is the latest state. So from there, you can start making queries and check balances and check transfer messages or things like that. So that connects them in a very nice way. Yeah. And like, if you look, I did an episode a while back on like different kinds of bridges and different security for different kinds of bridges and these cryptographic bridges tend to do best on the security front. And that's where like IBC is like that. Um, but I, I, it's funny because I thought for a long time, people were just like, you can't do that on Ethereum. You just can't. <laughs> that was the way yeah. everyone was like, you just can't do It was a paradigm that. shift, right? I mean, so basically yeah. just yeah. putting everything in a ZK socket. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's a trick, but it's a trick that works. <laughs> yeah. And, and it wasn't practical like two years ago, right? Like now things have become much faster and much more advanced and people have become better at doing this. And now it's practical. It wasn't practical two years ago. So it's cool. Yeah. yeah. And there are, so there's the succinct labs there. We actually did for like for ZKV, we do these events sometimes focused on specific networks. So we did one on Evmos and actually talked about ZK bridges. So there was like, we were able to find a few other teams doing something similar. There is like a ZK IBC. There is a team called ZK bridge. So, um, yeah, that's maybe that's also over on the YouTube channel. So if you do yeah, share yeah. a link to them, I can find it. You there. have Neil foundation that also did this yeah. with Mina and Ethereum. Yeah, um, Status yeah. also has one now, a ZK Bridge, and there's a team coming out of um, uh, Berkeley as well called, uh, I think, Specular. So, um, yeah, there's quite a few teams now. And yeah. um, in a way, this um, <clears throat> this is something that uh, we had no. So basically, the, the first deployment of the Succinct Bridge was between the Gnosis Testnet and yeah. uh, and uh, uh, and Gurley, the Ethereum Testnet. Um, so in a way, we've kind of we've been tracking um, this very closely, um, yeah. And but the thing is, uh, and this kind of leads me to my next topic: um, auditing Audit? this <laughs> is so difficult because basically, with a bridge, and I mean, with the number of bridge hacks we've seen this year, um, let's hope let's hope we've seen the last of them for this year at least. But um, there, and this there, is, there this are eight more December days. 20. Yeah, there are eight more <laughs> days, so <laughs> could be a couple of hundred million, whatever. But uh, yeah, so basically, uh, with the number of bridge hacks and the number of funds that are typically in bridges, um, kind of security is obviously of the utmost concern. I mean, obviously, yeah. it sucks um, with vulnerabilities and more or less anything. But basically, if it's um, if it's uh, uh, if it's a game or something, obviously, it's not you know, the, the consequences aren't that large. But yeah. how do you audit these ZK circuits? How do you make sure that the ZK circuit, because I mean, the bytecode itself, it's not exactly human readable. So yeah. how do you go about this? So first of all, can, can I just give a depressing thought about the security of 
like ZK oh, deployments <laughs> and bridges in general? Um, this is yes, but I will counteract your thought afterwards. But oh. go, go for it. Go for it, Kobe. <laughs> okay, uh, let's try. Uh, so the depressing thought that a lot of the hacks that we've seen have happened on, let's say, the integration layers. So you have these uh, complex solutions like the circuits and all that, and let's say the optimistic protocols and that part. But a lot of the hacks happen on the integration part, let's say on the smart contracts um, and so on, where you find a bug that happens after you verify the complex part. And I think that's a lot, that, that's the part that where hackers put a lot of effort in. And kind of something that is concerning me is that when they start looking at the more complex parts, maybe maybe they'll find more holes. So we'll see. Ooh. Oh, you're saying like maybe, yeah, okay. So like the, ha the hackers haven't even, they didn't even need to go that deep. The hacks yeah, happened way too exactly. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I'm totally with you. I mean, so basically the possibility space for making, for introducing vulnerabilities in complex systems is so large. And I mean, <laughs> even if you look at, if you look la at like um, the, the recent Binance bridge hack and so on, it was actually pretty sophisticated already. So basically the, yeah. yeah. So um, how how we actually thought about this. So obviously we, we thought about this for a long time because I mean, I mean we're German engineers, right? So we, we like <laughs> thinking about security audit. implications. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and audits. So this is why audits, yeah. I, but so far, no major hacks. So I mean, so far, you know, for a project that's been in this space for so long, Gnosis has had very few like vulnerabilities. I hope. Yeah, yeah. that's good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there have not been any. I mean, when you talk but, about audits of ZK systems, we do, I mean, just so you know, what ZK hack, when we introduce these puzzles, they're often based on historic failures. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, like, if you look at the puzzle page on the ZK hack site, it's basically meant to show you here's how like a bug can happen. Here's how a vulnerability did happen. But I think so, I mean, the Zcash bug, for example, could have been horrific. That could have been, been very bad. Yeah. Which they don't believe it has been. I did hear, I but saw they a tweet. can't recently. prove because well, it would have basically, you, you, you no, would have they, gotten more yeah. in the shielded pools, right? So basically you wouldn't no, have I known think, afterwards. So in, in their particular system, there was a way to kind of prove that it didn't happen because of when yeah. they did the upgrade and the number of tokens. Like at some point. Okay. You like you had to move, see. yeah. Yeah, not yeah. what everyone has, but like just a total. And so like had there been this exploit, which just could like yeah. mint infinity tokens, you would have seen it. But that's like a specific case where like, like there was only like five people in the world who understood what was happening anyways. And like they all worked there. So <laughs> like yeah. that's, I think, why that didn't get exploited. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. But but Kobe, how 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 we Let's were thinking about, about this yeah. this kind of security is yeah. kind of the it's kind of strengths in numbers. Basically, it's like yeah. you need to add redundancy. So basically, you put like a sieve and a sieve and a sieve, and then basically you have something that doesn't is not very sieve like anymore. Um, so basically, our idea and basically how how we're gonna um, uh, because you don't want to test anything in production, right? So basically, how, how yeah. we're gonna kind of move this to production without uh endangering um uh client funds or user funds um is by actually creating a multi-sig of bridges so basically mm. you have you have the old omni bridge which is basically a multi-sig based bridge um and you put put it put it in a multi-sig with um the new zk light client mm. bridge and basically if they agree on a payout payout happens if they don't agree payout doesn't happen um and then basically you have to you ha have to in order to compromise that you have to find a vulnerability in the zk light client bridge but at the same time you actually have to compromise a majority of the um signers for yeah. the multi sig bridge so basically that that will make it like at least uh you know uh an order of magnitude more difficult to kind of break it and we're also yeah. working with other zk light client bridge teams so basically that um, in the future, we will have two or three independent implementations of zk like client bridges. And basically, there will be an and rule. So basically, if these agree, <laughs> uh, 
payout happens. If these don't agree, nothing happens. Um, and basically in that way, you can reduce um, yeah. your exposure significantly well, enormously because not only you don't have to find just one vulnerability in one bridge you actually have to find vulnerabilities in three different implementations of zk client bridges obviously that could happen if there's like if you have like a zk uh, like like one of those bugs where there's a you know, bug in a paper, for instance, like f f what happened with uh, Zcash at the time. Yeah. But it becomes a lot less likely um, that everything kind of has the same uh, breaking point. Uh, yeah. So no, I, I think I think it's very responsible. I think it's a good approach, like to add security in depth. I, I'm a very big fan of security in depth in general. So, for example, um, you know, sometimes even people don't like things like SGX, right? But I, think, I don't like SGX. Yeah, <laughs> it's a black um, box. It's really difficult to trust. Yeah, but if you add, if it, you add it as another, yeah, exactly. Like if you add it as another component, as security in depth, it is something that might add security. So yes. here, if you do like add a multi-sig bridge, and you know, maybe it, maybe it's easy to bribe all of them. You know, there are some rich people that can bribe all of these signers, but it adds uh, some measure of security. So it is nice, and I, I think that's a very responsible way to approach it. So, but yeah, like if we're talking about like auditing the circuits themselves, I think it's still a pretty hard task. Um, I, I remember like. Um, I was doing some audits, like when, when I was uh, in Kedit, we also like audited sapling, uh, like the Zcash upgrade before it came out. And it seems to me that still the most successful or the most elaborate audits happen when people do manual reviews and they see a specification in front of them and they vet the specification first and then they see that the code matches the specification and so on. And I think the Zcash team has been spectacular in writing good specifications. And that, that was something that, in my opinion, makes them system, like I'm, I'm, I have a high confidence in their system because of that. Um, but Today, we still do a lot of manual audits. There are some companies that try to improve on that. Like there has been work by the Kestrel people that now are part of Helio, I think, that they've this done some formal, formal verification. verification. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And Veridice is also doing, uh, developing a bunch of tooling around that, but still not yet widely used. Um, but one of the things that I think contributes more practically to security and still don't happen as much as I would like is the creation of common components that you can reuse and that get audited and then get deployed and have a bunch of stake in them in some sense because they're deployed in high stakes places. And that increases the confidence in the components themselves. And then if you use this as a major part in your application. You can just piggyback on yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. And I think we, we've done some of this when we were developing a semaphore. So we audited these components and some other people were using them. And, and I would like to see that more now in the new realms of ZK where we use Plonk and other kinds of systems. It's harder there because you also have a lot of flexibility. You can customize it a lot. But if we find as a community a Plonk construction that we can line on, maybe we can start developing these components that people could reuse. And that, yeah, that makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah, I think for that also um, having uh, some sort of uh, some sort of uh, you know uh, benchmarking tool which tells <laughs> you um, how much certain components have been used and what mm. the amount riding That's on good. them has yeah. been. I think that would be yeah. super super useful. That would be nice. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, there was a last point, right? Yes. But it's ZKML, and I yeah. don't know anything really about that to say. <laughs> what, what, what is ZKML? Oh, so that, that's an interesting topic. I think it's become, it has become from zero to 100 popular in some sense. In like the last month. <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah, a month or two, something like yeah. that. But uh, it's it's a topic that become very popular. So ZKML in general is proving that you evaluated uh, a model that you got the results from evaluating a machine learning model or a neural network, and proving that you did it correctly with the right model uh, with signed inputs or so on, and. In that way, you can run this in different environments, not necessarily the environment that consumes the result, but enjoy, like, be confident that you got the correct result. So one, one example would be for, um, like, face liveness detection, where you would see if someone has, um, like, you can do this for KYC or things of that sort. Um, but you have other use cases. You can think about, let's say, GPT-3 today or ChatGPT, where you you want to know that you're getting the results from the right model that was at least claimed to have been trained uh, on some specific or some set of inputs. And you will then be sure that it you get the result from that model and not something that someone else invented that didn't include all the history of some region uh, in the world, let's say. So We recently had Jensen on. Um, are you familiar with them? Jensen? Jensen, uh, G-E-N-S-Y-N. It was episode 471. Uh, basically, it's about deep learning compute and kind of... Uh, distributed, basically making that distributed. And basically there you mm. also have this checkpointing problem that basically you have to, people have to prove that they actually did run your, 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 the data through some sort of model and basically how involved that was. And yeah, we also talked um, a bit about how difficult that actually is to prove because it's not deterministic. So it's, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. One other angle on this, so like I have not done a deep dive, so I only like really, all I've understood though is there's like two ways of thinking about it. One is the way that Kobe just described of like attesting to the the model, but I have heard it also described, like I've just, I've heard the idea of doing kind of like the model making, building the model on encrypted data or like, and so it's not so much ZK. Yeah. I think People kind of it's don't like think homo that's homomorphic it, encryption. Exactly. It's probably going to be yeah. like FHE or HE somehow. Um, but yeah, just in, like the topic of ZK also, it's it's often like super mixed up with all the other advanced cryptography like MPC and FHE. Which is great. I think they should awesome. mix more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you're actually mixing them and sometimes just like in people's minds, they're like, very Listen. complicated cryptography <laughs> over there. Um, yeah. <laughs> Difficult yeah, maths. There, there does seem to be some really cool overlap between the ML, AI worlds and ZK now, which is cool. I'm excited for the new year to like meet some of these people building this stuff. Yeah, some really <laughs> good people working on this, on, on ZK ML. So I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes. Cool. So it seems like... Um, while like for the last three years or so, most of the progress has kind of hinged on the succinctness property um, of CK uh, proofs. It seems like it now um, ventures more into like the privacy preserving realm that obviously it can also offer. Would you agree? Oh, I, I see well, Anna kind of I think wiggling I her think, head. I think there's been those two I think the blockchain, the wanting to scale the blockchain accelerated the succinctness for sure. And like that yes. idea of using it as validity instead of privacy. I think those ideas were really awesome and they were like super easily kind of understood and then used. But I do think like as what what I've what has happened is like ZK connecting to blockchain accelerated ZK development so much that now the, the ZK libraries are 
quite good and they're getting better, they start to be able to be used even outside of blockchain. And often in those cases, it is privacy that's the main part. So yeah. Can you give maybe, examples? Well, I did. I gave this one example that I don't know that much about. Like about the, the video the thing? Google, well, the, the video one, but like Google and GDPR. I mean, there was mm -hmm. years ago, Cloudflare used it in a non-blockchain context. I've, I mean, we've talked to people who did like password protection yeah. barely touching the blockchain. But I think what I've understood is all the major um, like tech companies, Web2 companies have teams building ZK stuff outside of the blockchain context. Yeah. I think uh, Apple probably is doing something, but obviously like I don't know because um, yeah. they don't tell you stuff. But um, <laughs> true private, very private. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think yeah. I think we're going to see a lot of non-blockchain ZK use cases that use privacy in the yeah. in the near future. I, I think, like in in some sense, that these non-blockchain use cases, we see a lot of let's say very specific constructions for like a very optimized protocol for a concrete use case, like you said in Cloudflare and and what others do. And maybe sometimes people don't bundle them with ZK because we're used to snarks, which are general purpose, but definitely a lot of advanced and super interesting cryptography happen all around. Um, but uh, yeah, but actually about privacy, I think if we, if we look at it, we actually see, would see that the first deployments of ZK in blockchain was about privacy, right? Like scalability came later in some That sense. is true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh, I just remembered a use case we forgot to mention, by the way, and one that's hyper relevant today. It is on chain mostly, but it's proof of reserves and ZK. Oh yeah. This mm. is and it's, it's actually I would call it a it's a it's both. It's attestation, but often the reason you're using ZK is also for privacy. So like so that you're not like just overtly showing everybody's bank account or crypto accounts. You actually can retain some privacy. Yeah, that's kind of a good hybrid example. It is a good use case. Yeah. So what are you guys excited about for 2023? <laughs> I, well, I'm going to, uh, ZKML is the place I want to explore. It's already been declared on the last show we did of the year that Tarun is like, I predict <laughs> that there will be more ZKML guests. <laughs> so I, yeah, I think we're going to, we're going to start bringing on some more folks like that. I think that's true. I think that's one very interesting topic. Um, I, I'm, I'm like, you want to go more? Like, no, yes, go ahead. Go for it. Okay. So um, I, I'm generally excited to see um, the development or the, um, let's say, much like the tooling around ZK and just advanced cryptography mature. I, like one analogy that I had in my mind is that you know, when you start out with electronics, you just connect like uh, an LED with a battery and then you have like it turn on. It's very nice. That's kind of where we were with the tooling like a year ago in ZK. So now we're at the part of like maybe something that is more akin to an Arduino, which is still quite crude. And then you put it on, uh, on, um, on this board where you put the wires, but it's still quite messy. So you have these components that you can connect, but I think we're getting to a stage where it becomes something that feels very real and you can design extremely complex things that interact with each other and you have efficient components that you can connect like transistors. Like this is kind of an analogy that I have in my mind. So I'm excited to see this kind of tooling develop and people mi mixing and matching these kind of things. But generally also seeing other kinds of cryptography intermixing with those. So we've seen some of that also from Dan Bonet's group, by the way, like this collaborative SNARKs approach where you combine MPC with SNARKs, like use proving ZK, the correct execution of a multi-party computation. Um, so I would love to see more of that uh, happening and I think it can unlock a bunch of interesting use cases. Yeah, I think it's the use cases like this past year, like 
I mean, a lot of what we mentioned today are actually newer to us too. Like they've yeah. come up in the last year, not all of them, but a, a number of those. I, I remember years ago having a really like kind of having just such a few number of use cases, <laughs> like trying to pick like, oh yeah, and you can do payments kind of, um, you can scale. But yeah, this time around, it's like, there's a real, there's a real list and I think it's going to keep growing. Yeah, I, I think, I think, uh, yeah, exactly. And I think more, more, let's say, engineers that do not specialize in cryptography would be able to access these technologies, which is not quite true today. So I, I hope that will happen and that will spark more ideas and more use cases 2023. What about fears for 2023? What is something that we absolutely must get right? Ooh. It's funny, my fear for 2021 had come true, actually, which was like a large scale ZK project gets tied to international crime. And it did. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, we didn't talk much about Tornado, but I think it was a reckoning for the ZK space and it's yeah. pushed some teams towards compliance and some away. Uh, I think fears are that that people use ZK for nefarious purposes that are worse than Tornado. I don't know. That's what I would not want. Yeah. I actually would, would say that what we must get right is how to how to get people to use privacy in a way that doesn't hurt them. Because mm. I think a lot of people today use privacy and like, like they use tools in general and maybe they don't think about the implications. So, yeah. But there are want... technological ways in which kind of this could be addressed, right? So for instance, yeah. um, for Tornado, there was the idea that you can have curated lists of addresses you don't yeah. want to be mixed with and then you can prove that you weren't mixed with these exactly. addresses and so on yeah. and it can just be like an ad blocker where basically you you subscribe to some service that kind of tells you who to, who not to play with and uh, so i think there's actually yeah. technological solutions for lots of things totally. but yeah. what what I'm worried about sorry i'm hijacking my own question here <laughs> <laughs> what i'm worried about is um that privacy um, as a concept somehow gets discredited, that it kind of mm -hmm. goes down the drain because um, people tired to um, nefarious purposes or basically where it's been used in nefarious ways, where I would kind of p posit, um, and it's, it's a value, right? Basically, it's kind of like something that, that kind of um, you have to, you subscribe to or you don't, but um, I do believe that privacy should be a human right. Mm. <laughs> and I think I kind of the erosion yeah. of that, how do you feel about that? Well, I just, I was about to say, I think actually Tornado in a way, and like a lot of things this year, if anything, right this at this moment, I actually think there's a renewed interest in having privacy. I actually no. think the last few years, there's been more of like a laissez-faire, oh well. I actually, I, I think I feel more of like a realization that it's not just like a fun, nice to have, but more of a pillar if you really want the world you want. And I think, I, I, I don't know. I felt that at least the, the tone of discourse has actually shifted in that way. So my, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that in the new year, it actually continues to be relevant, if not more relevant. But we may go through another phase where we don't care. That would that's totally possible. I mean, I mean, the, I think there are also like levels of privacy that have not been properly explored yet. Like, I I want privacy from let's say I don't want this random person to see what I'm doing. For example, in my bank account today, but I'm okay with I don't know the bank seeing this or mm. some other entities seeing it. So this is a level of privacy that like, like it's not all or nothing. Like it like doesn't have to be permissions tornado. Control. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Permissions or who you reveal it to, or like you want privacy from the public. Definitely. I think this is definitely something that mm -hmm. I would like to see, but there are levels yeah. to this. I also, I do think that the builders, you know, they've made decisions, but I think 
another decision that's been made is to use exactly what you described, Frederica, these like new um, architectures or like techniques to actually avoid the bad behavior, but still have these systems for good actors. I, I think they're think I think a lot of teams are thinking more about that. There had yeah. been this attitude of like, oh well, we decentralize, then we're not in trouble, mm. or we add a viewing key, and then we're not in trouble. But actually, like the effectiveness of these are questionable. I yeah. think like <laughs> there are some new techniques that haven't been explored, haven't been used, and maybe there'll be more. And I think people thinking about those techniques is really important no. because I think we want. Like you said, Kobe, I think we want a place where we can act privately, but we also don't want just bad actors to, to come in and re, like use those yeah. those tools in ways that just like hurt society. Yeah, I think this these are really good last words, Anna. Yeah. Are you happy with these as last words? Sure, <laughs> for the year. You're, your well, last for, for words. My, well, my last year, words for the year. Let's say. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you both for coming on. Um, yeah. I learned a lot. Um, I am still confused. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so am I. <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think I would love some benchmarking. You know, just like some tables that tell you this is good at that. This is performance for this this solution for this kind of uh, set of problems. To me, that would be. Um, shining a light where it needs to be sh shown so it's mm. uh yeah but i think the things have to come live they have to happen before and then we have to see and then like i think was the with incentives. Yeah. yeah there might be a best best team wins or there might be this really interesting multi l2 scenario with with awesome ZK bridges to L1s and they're all like, they have their niche and their use cases that like fit for exactly their architecture. Yeah, it's going to be exciting to see how it come, how it goes. <laughs> Thank you both for coming on. Thank you for giving us so much of your time. And um, I wish you a super happy holiday season and uh, get into the new year very safely. Yeah, you too. Happy holidays. Thanks for having us on. <laughs> Thanks, Frederica. Thank you.